on World News Tonight. Supreme Court shutdown. LGBTQ activists suffer a blow as same-sex marriage remains illegal. Barrage of missiles. Explosions and thick clouds of smoke were seen across the Gaza skyline as Hamas storms missiles. China's gamble. The Belt and Road Initiative kicks off in Beijing with key global players preparing for decisive discussions. And spooky pooches. Peru sees puppy participants put on their best performance, buying for the top prize. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News this Tuesday night. Tonight we begin with a landmark decision made in India's Supreme Court that has potentially impacted approximately 140 million people. India's Supreme Court has declined an appeal to legalize same-sex marriages in a blow for LGBTQ rights in the world's most populous country. A five-judge bench announced the ruling today after hearing arguments in the case between April and May. Chief Justice Dhananjay Yaswan Chandrachad said that it was outside the court's remit to decide that issue and that parliament should write the laws governing marriage. However, Chandrachad said the state should still provide some legal protections to same-sex couples, arguing that denying them benefits and services granted to heterosexual couples violates their fundamental rights. He added that choosing a life partner is an integral part of choosing one's course of life. Chandra should said the government should also take steps to ensure that the LGBTQ people will not face discrimination, including by establishing hotlines and safe houses for those who are vulnerable and ending medical procedures that aim to change gender identity or sexual orientation. The court's ruling follows a petition arguing that the failure to re recognize same-sex unions violated LGBTQ people's constitutional rights. India's Bharatiya Janata Party government, led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, opposed the petition, arguing the issue should be left to Parliament and that the appeal represented an urban and elitist perspective. And moving on to China now, the third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation kicks off in Beijing as China seeks to expand its leadership on the global stage amid its rivalry with the US. Russia's Vladimir Putin arrived in Beijing. This is Putin's second known trip since the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for him in March over alleged war crimes in Ukraine. Also, Sri Lankan President Ranil Wickremesinghe arrived in Beijing to attend the third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation. And this is his ninth visit to China. During the two-day event, President Xi will deliver an opening speech as the event marks the 10th anniversary of its key One Belt, One Road initiative, which aims to bolster economic cooperation along the land and sea routes from China to Central Asia and Europe. Some 140 countries are expected to participate with eyes of a possible summit between President Xi and his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin. That will be their second face-to-face -face this year, with their solidarity against the U.S. likely to take center stage of their discussions, which could also entail a message on the Israel-Hamas conflict. And next in Gwadar, the port city of Pakistan faced a drinking water crisis as citizens announced a complete shutdown to draw attention to the current situation. The water crisis has highlighted the city's incapability to face such essential shortages. The port city of Gwadar in Pakistan is grappling with a severe drinking water shortage, prompting its citizens to declare a complete shutdown to draw attention to the dire situation. The water crisis has brought to light the city's inability to cope with critical shortages despite having access to adequate water resources in the region. For a whole week, the residents of Gwadar have been wrestling with this water crisis and their pleas for assistance appeared to go unanswered. The shutterdown strike organized by the Citizen Committee Gwadar resulted in the closure of businesses, shops and banks. This extreme measure was taken as a last resort by a community that felt parched and ignored. The publication revealed that the situation unfolded within the city even though the region possesses suitable water resources. The Gwada water crisis stemmed from a dispute between the DG Gwada Development Authority and public health engineering officials, underscoring the urgency of effective governance and dispute resolution mechanisms. The gravity of the situation is accentuated by the fact that this crisis occurred concurrently with a sit-in in Turbat related to a power supply suspension issue in border areas. Successful negotiations in Turbat, which resulted in a power load shedding schedule and a predetermined monthly bill, could potentially serve as a model for handling such crises more effectively.
And now an update on Israel-Hamas war as Hamas fired rockets against Israeli cities of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who's on his second Israel trip, had to take shelter during his meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister. Also, the European Union said it would launch a humanitarian air bridge operation consisting of several flights to Egypt, aiming to bring supplies to humanitarian organizations on the ground in Gaza. The cities of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv were under fire on Monday. Rocket alert sirens went off and blasts were heard across the cities. Palestinian militant group Hamas said it fired a barrage of missiles at the cities in response to what it called Israel's targeting of civilians. According to the Washington Post, at least 1,400 people have been killed and over 4,000 injured in Israel, while nearly 2,800 people have been killed and nearly 10,000 wounded in Gaza since a surprise attack by Hamas on Israel sparked new fighting in the region on October 7th. Also on Monday, people gathered at the Rafah crossing on the Gaza-Egypt border following reports that it would be reopened during a brief ceasefire. The crossing has been shut for security reasons since Hamas took control of Gaza in 2007. If the border were to open, Gazans with dual citizenship could leave the territory and humanitarian aid now waiting on the Egyptian side could enter. However, both Israel and Hamas have denied reports of reopening, exacerbating an already desperate humanitarian crisis. Amid the deepening crisis in Gaza, the U.S. is ramping up its diplomatic efforts. President Joe Biden is set to visit Israel on Wednesday as the country has agreed with Israel to come up with a plan to let humanitarian aid into Gaza. But the critical reopening of the Rafah crossing remains unclear. U.S. President Joe Biden will visit Israel to reaffirm solidarity. That is according to U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Tuesday, following an overnight meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Israel's war cabinet members in Tel Aviv on Monday. On Wednesday, President Biden will visit Israel. He's coming here at a critical moment for Israel, for the region, and for the world. The President will reaffirm the United States' solidarity with Israel and our ironclad commitment to its security. Biden's scheduled meeting comes as Israel prepares for a ground offensive against Hamas in Gaza. Blinken also said the U.S. and Israel are set to work together to provide humanitarian aid to civilians in need. The United States and Israel have agreed to develop a plan that will enable humanitarian aid from donor nations and multilateral organizations to reach civilians in Gaza. And then the U.S. official made his second visit to Israel in under a week, where he reaffirmed firm support from the U.S. for Israel. Monday's overnight meeting lasted for over six hours. At one point, however, a State Department spokesperson said the meeting was briefly interrupted by air raid sirens, forcing Blinken and Netanyahu to take shelter in a bunker for five minutes. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. A federal judge has barred Donald Trump from criticizing prosecutors, the court and possible witnesses ahead of his trial on election subversion charges. It follows recent remarks in which the former president slammed prosecutors as a team of thugs and attacked one witness in the case as a gutless pig. A federal judge on Monday barred Donald Trump from verbally attacking those involved in a criminal case that accuses him of trying to overturn his 2020 election loss. That includes U.S. prosecutors, court staff, and potential witnesses. U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkin pointed to disparaging social media posts and said she would not allow Trump to, quote, launch a pre-trial smear campaign. While speaking at a campaign rally in Iowa, the former U.S. president, who has pleaded not guilty, vowed to appeal the judge's order. Today, a judge put on a gag order. I'll be the only politician in history that runs with a gag order where I'm not allowed to criticize people. The order bars the frontrunner for the 2024 Republican presidential nomination and his attorneys from personally targeting special counsel Jack Smith, prosecutors working with him, and court staff. It also prevents Trump from discussing potential witnesses as relates to the testimony at trial. But Chutkin said she would allow Trump to make critical statements about the U.S. Justice Department 
and that denounced the prosecution as politically motivated. Trump's trial is due to begin in five months. Moving on to the road to the White House now. Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida rejected criticism from Republican presidential rival Nikki Haley of remarks he made about Palestinians over the weekend. In an interview over the weekend, DeSantis dismissed Haley's criticisms as her trying to be politically correct. At a campaign event in Iowa, DeSantis said that the U.S. should not accept any refugees from Gaza and that the Palestinians in Gaza are all anti-Semitic. Haley, a former governor of South Carolina who also served as UN ambassador in the Trump administration, said that half of Palestinians don't want to be governed by Hamas. When confronted about the remarks and Haley's rebuke, DeSantis said he was simply defending the truth and pointed to efforts by Hamas to teach the kids to hate Jews. The row between the two candidates also comes as Haley has seen her stock rise as a GOP alternative to former President Donald Trump, the current frontrunner in the 2024 Republican primary. DeSantis and Haley have each tried to co-op the same pool of conservative donors. Haley has also seen her polling improve in early states as the DeSantis campaign had stumbled in recent weeks. <music> Climate change is affecting navigation on the Amazon River, where a severe drought is disrupting barrage traffic on the Tapajos River in the Amazon rainforest. The Amazon has experienced a record number of wildfires this October after a severe drought. Yesterday, the Negro River, according to the port of Manaus, which is a central port in the capital city of the Brazilian state of Amazonas, hit a level of 13.59 meters, the lowest since 1902. The region has experienced months without rain, leading to an intense drought. That drought is contributing to record wildfires. According to Brazil's National Institute for Space Research, in the first 15 days of October, more than 2,900 wildfires have broken out in the Amazonas, more than any other October. October month since 1998. In the first half of 2023, 3.6 million acres of the Amazon rainforest has been burned by wildfires, according to the Rainforest Foundation. The drought has disrupted cargo shipping along the region's rivers and depleted food, water and medical resources for Amazonian indigenous communities. Meanwhile, the fires have generated clouds of smoke that have brought the air quality to surrounding areas to danger. Meanwhile, the fires have generated clouds of smoke that have brought the air quality to surrounding areas to dangerous levels. These extreme weather circumstances circumstances in Amazonas has been connected with both human-driven deforestation, which worsens climate change, and the El Nino weather phenomenon, a naturally occurring climate pattern that brings warmer ocean surface temperatures in the central and eastern tropical Pacific Ocean. Over in North Korea, as the country has reaffirmed its long-held usual stance at the UN that Pyongyang will not let go of its nuclear weapons. Meanwhile, former U.S. Ambassador to South Korea, Haley Harris, has called for strengthened nuclear deterrence for South Korea amid threats from the North. During the first committee of the United Nations General Assembly meeting on Monday, North Korea's Secretary for North Korea's permanent mission to the United Nations, Kim in Char, said Pyongyang will not give up its nuclear weapons as it faces continuous threats from the United States. Kim said that the U.S. continues to deploy nuclear assets to the Korean Peninsula, which are disguised with claims of being defensive in nature. He also added that the U.S. continues to conduct nuclear weapons tests despite its condemnation of North Korea's nuclear ambitions and has been accelerating a nuclear arms race. Both Seoul and Tokyo condemned Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions, calling for the North to give up its nuclear weapons and return to dialogue. Meanwhile, former U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Harry Harris during a virtual seminar called for the U.S. to keep strengthening its extended deterrence commitment to South Korea as he stressed that North Korea's evolving military threats are far greater than before. Harris said that the North has been doubling down on its nuclear and missile programs under an aggressive nuclear policy stipulated in its constitution. However, the former ambassador said it would be a mistake to redeploy U.S. tactical nuclear arms to the Korean Peninsula. Harris, who served from 2018 to 2021, also raised concerns about technological cooperation between Pyongyang and Moscow. Welcome back. Two Swedish citizens killed in a shooting in Brussels. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world. 
Two Swedish citizens have been killed in a shooting by a government still at large. The incident occurred yesterday evening ahead of a football match between Belgium and Sweden. Russia has started banning imports of all fish and seafood from Japan over Fukushima wastewater concerns. This is a precautionary measure until comprehensive information confirms the safety of the seafood. Capitol Hill is on day 13 now without a Speaker of the House. Jim Jordan has now been nominated. The House is expected to hold votes to elect the next Speaker soon. Business heir Daniel Noboa won Ecuador's presidential election, vowing to rebuild a South American country which is struggling with a weak economy and rising crime and violence. Italy's tax police said that 50 people had been arrested in Italy and Spain on suspicion of international drug trafficking, money laundering and fraud. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight in Peru as dog owners in the Peruvian capital Lima dress their pets up to take part in an annual Halloween costume contest. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.